Hi, this is Pastor Bob Cornell, and this is the Understanding James series. Did you realize that one day that you and I and every true child of God is going to stand before Jesus and be judged? Yes, it's called the judgment seat of Christ, and James dealt with it in James chapter 2, and we're going to look at that today and several other things, and this is so important for us to understand it as children of God, because we are to view ourselves in that way, in that one day, we're going to stand before Jesus and give an account of what he has given us and what we did with it. So let's get right into it. James chapter 1, today beginning in verse 12, as you can see on the screen, this is a part of the paragraph, as you can see there, verses 8 through 13, fulfilling the royal law. And you can study the previous verses leading up to this in prior videos. But let's look at this, verse 12. James writes, So speak ye, and so do, as those that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Now I'm going to put some uh, notes on the screen here. When he mentions there, so speak ye and so do, what he was meaning there, it means in contrast to the one who just speaks and doesn't do. And this was a problem among the believers that James was writing to. We're going to see more of that in today's uh, video and the scriptures that we'll be covering. Again, there was a contrast between what the believers were saying and what they were doing. And that's what James is dealing with. And he says, so speak ye and so do as those that will be judged by the law of liberty. So you can see there on the screen, the believer, that's you and I, we should live our life not by Old Testament law or self-made laws of, quote, righteousness, but by the law of of liberty. That's what James says, by the law of liberty. Now what is that, that law of liberty? That law of liberty is referring to what he referred to in verse James 1 and verse 25, the perfect law of liberty. Now as I put there on the screen, one day every believer's faithfulness will be judged by Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. And our faithfulness that will be evaluated by Christ on that day will be faithfulness to, again, the law of liberty. Uh, and what is that? Again, it's the same as the perfect law of liberty, as, as I just mentioned, James 125, and abbreviating there that PLL, that's the perfect law of liberty. That's the perfect spiritual law that brings liberty from the power of sin, from Satan and self through our faith, our dependence in Jesus, who he is, and what he accomplished through his death. Again, that perfect law of liberty is the same as what Paul mentioned in Romans chapter 8 and verse 2 when he referred to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Again, same spiritual law, different terminology. And so James says here by the spirit, so speak and live your life as those that realizing that one day we're going to stand before Christ and be evaluated based on our faithfulness to what Christ has done for us. It's important that we understand what that word judge means. That word judged in verse 12, it's the Greek word krino, that's the root word, and it simply means to determine, to judge, to evaluate. As you can see in the screen, it's a present passive infinitive. Okay, what is all? That's all Greek. Okay, what does that mean? It means that we we are presently. That's the present tense. Okay, we are presently and in the future. That's the infinitive mood. Okay, and then the passive voice means that we we are the recipients of this action. It's something that God is doing to us. Okay, He is the one who's evaluating us, and so we are presently and in the future being viewed and evaluated by God through the law of liberty, okay, and that really at the core of it is through our dependence in Christ and what he's done. All right, moving on to verse 13, for he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment or over judgment. Here's, here's the key that James was giving here. If we judge others with no mercy, no love, no grace, and the way that God judges people, okay, that, that's so important. That's the way God evaluates people. It's through his mercy. It's through his grace, his love. So if we judge and evaluate other people with no mercy, 
as believers, okay, then God will judge us in the same way. Now that's done in a way that only God can do it. And as you can see in the screen here, this doesn't refer to our justification because whenever we stand before Christ at the judgment of Christ, it's not our justification that's being evaluated. That's closed. That, that, that's case closed, okay? It's our sanctification. It's our condition. It's our faithfulness that's going to be evaluated and judged. And, and so it doesn't refer to our justification. It refers to the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit that's being frustrated. That is when we don't give others the mercy that God has given us. That's what James is referring to. Now mercy, the word mercy, it means compassion or restraint shown towards those who cannot help themselves or deserve punishment. And so at the very core of mercy is a heart that is moved with compassion. And that's what God does with us. He's His heart, because He loves mankind, His heart is moved with compassion to us in our miserable, sinful condition. Now, as you can see there, the cross is the ultimate expression of God's mercy. Because at the cross, Christ took our punishment that we deserved. And that's basically mercy. It's, it's God taking upon himself what we deserved. And then grace is him giving us what we don't deserve. You see, grace and mercy and love, they're all tied together. And so because God is a God of mercy and Jesus is a Savior of mercy, we ought to be people of mercy. Move with compassion towards others in their miserable condition. Then he mentions mercy triumphs over judgment. Oh, what a statement that is. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That means mercy rejoices in triumph over the judgment of the law, because with mercy we receive what we don't deserve. And through His mercy, we're not getting what we, what we deserve, which is God's judgment. Again, God's mercy and His grace are all intertwined together. And so mercy triumphs over the judgment of the law, the judgment that we rightfully deserve because of sin. All right, moving on to the next passage, you can see it on the top of the screen, verses 14 through 26, the evidence of living faith, good works. Now, this is the passage that so many over the centuries, even in the present day, have a problem with as it concerns James. And the reason why, I believe, is because so many just simply don't understand really what James was getting at. And the blunt way in which James said things can cause people to have reservations as if possibly James was promoting works as a means of righteousness before God, which I'll say this, he was absolutely not. So, what was James meaning in this passage? For example, when he says here in verse 14, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith, and have not works. Can faith save him? Whoa! All right, what, 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 what is this? Is James preaching another gospel? I, I think you know the answer to that. No, he's not. But the big question here is, okay, what is he meaning? Now, as you can see on the screen here, this statement in verse 14 is the foundational verse for this whole passage. It's a man saying he has true faith but there is a lack of evidence of it in his life. Do you get that? That's, if you're taking notes, it's so important. Get this down. Okay, even if you're not taking notes. Okay, take notes now. This is important. This is the foundational statement for this whole passage. What is it? It's the man saying. Again, he's verbalizing. I have faith or I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a believer. But there is a lack of evidence of it in his life. That's what James said here when he said, Though a man say he has faith and have not works, can faith that faith save him? I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But let's pick this apart. When he said here, what does it profit? The idea there is what does it profit is, is, is value before God. What value 
does it have before God? Matthew 16, verse 26, Jesus said this, What profit, and the same word, okay, Greek word, what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So that's the way that that James is using the word profit. What value is it? Now, if a man say he has faith. Now that word say there is a verb that's in the present tense, meaning he continually is saying he has faith. Again, that's so important to understand that his life, he's continually saying, I have faith. I, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christian. Because this is, again, this is the foundational statement. So with that said, the man is saying he has faith, but James says he doesn't have works. And the words have not works in the present tense in the Greek, which means he continually does not have works. So let's take a look at the word works. Okay, what does that mean? And I'll put several notes on the screen here. The word works is the Greek word ergon, and that is a main word in the New Testament. It refers to effective works or productive activity. Uh, figuratively, it could be referred to as fruit or evidence. Ergon implies that there is a power at work producing effective work or effective activity, effective fruitfulness. Do you get that? So ergon, the Greek word, implies and means that there is an effective work happening on the inside. Now, that effective working is through the power of the Holy Spirit. As you can see on the screen here, the power is the Holy Spirit. The cross is the means. Jesus is the source. And so when he talked about works here, that is the fruit of faith. And the main work in this passage, as the Holy Spirit led James to write it, is obedience to God's Word. And we'll talk about that more in future videos, but the obedience, the main obedience that he referred to as an example was the obedience of Abraham taking his son Isaac up to the top of Mount Moriah and offering him as a sacrifice. That's what God told him to do. That was a test of his faith, and Abraham obeyed God. And God provided that ram in the thicket in the place of Isaac. And that was a type, basically, of Jesus, what he would do for us. And so uh, that's the works. It's the fruit of faith, and the main work, okay, in this passage is obedience. And so that really is the same for you and I. Are we obedient to God's word? Are we obedient to keep on believing? When the Holy Spirit leads us to do something, whatever it may be, whether he tells us to speak or to shut our mouth, he tells us to praise him, okay, or tells us, leads us to pray, or leads us to witness, leads us to, to give, whatever it is. Are we obedient in the things that God tells us to be obedient? I'll mention this, that when he talks about obedience, okay, when I mention that, it's, it's not simply just in intellectually believing in Christ and even his death and resurrection. And actually, James is dealing with this, that intellectually and verbally saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe in that. That's not true obedience. True obedience is that there's faith, okay, and faith is the action of the heart that leads to obedience in the hands, in the eyes, in the ears, in our feet. Does that make sense? That is true obedience. Obedience outwardly that comes from faith inwardly. And that's so important. All right, moving on, some other notes here. He says, can faith save him? What a statement. And this is where there's so much confusion. What, what is James meaning here? Can faith save him? You know, the Apostle Paul said, yes, it is by faith. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, For it's by grace through faith that we are saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's a gift from God. So what is James meaning here? Well, again, take it in context. That's so important, the context. It's this. It's that man saying he has faith. That statement, can faith save him, literally is this, and I'll take myself on the screen, can that faith, 
That means the faith that is just words or theory with no fruit. Can that faith save him? That's the question that James is asking. I want to make that clear. He's, he's not asking the question, can true faith in Jesus Christ and what he did and he rose from the dead, can that true faith save a person? That is not the question that James is asking. Because the answer to that question is absolutely yes. The question he's asking is, can that faith that is, in, that is only in words or intellectual theory with no fruit in one's life, can that faith save him? And the answer to that question is no. That type of faith that is only in word or theory intellectually with no fruit, no evidence in one's life, okay, regardless of if a believer comes to church, or if they do some Christian do's and don'ts, okay? The, doing the Christian do's and don'ts that, that can vary in different people, that in itself is, is good, okay, if a person comes to church. But if they come to church, but then they live their, the rest of their life, again, as if there, there is no Jesus in their life, can that faith save him? Now, God is the ultimate judge. Only he can see the heart. So we have to be very careful about free, being fruit inspectors in the, in the sense of evaluating people's salvation. Only God is the ultimate one who knows, the, knows that. All right. So that's important to understand. At the same time, it is correct for us to evaluate a person's life, the fruit that's in their life, the message that a preacher preaches. We can do that. That's proper for us to evaluate those things. Now, again, that's proper to evaluate, but as it concerns a conclusion about an individual's salvation, that's not our prerogative. That's God's prerogative. And we have to be very careful about judging a person's salvation or even putting them and some scale of sanctification, okay? We have to be very careful about that. All right, I want to show you this chart on the screen here. And you can see on the left-hand side, and I'll take myself off the screen here, that in Christ, that's us, that little stick man, okay, in Christ, that's you and I, we're the believer. We are to have faith or dependence in Christ and the cross. That's the way that God works, by grace through faith in the person of Jesus, who he is, and that's a lot, and what he accomplished through his death and the cross and the fact that he rose from the dead. Now, when, whenever a person from the heart exhibits faith, dependence in Jesus and what he did, what does God do in response? He gives us his Holy Spirit. He gives us his grace. And that you can see that on the screen here in this handout. And this handout, by the way, you can download it. It's in the first comment of this video. You can download it to your computer. He gives us his Holy Spirit. Now, this, this uh, illustration can be used in regards to our initial salvation experience. And it can be used in, the, in our everyday Christian living and sanctification. So as we live by faith, now as I apply it to sanctification, as we live by faith, he's continually giving us the help of his Holy Spirit. And his grace is working in us. And it produces, you can see the lines in the bottom there, the fruit of faith in the cross. Sanctification is produced. And it's the Holy Spirit working in us, influencing us, and we don't become robots of the Holy Spirit because we will always have free will. As you can see the lines of the Holy Spirit, His grace, His saving grace, and His sanctifying grace. It works in us, but we have to cooperate with the influence of the Holy Spirit. Boy, that is so important. Again, we have to cooperate with obedient faith to, to the influence of the Holy Spirit. And what is he influencing us with? He's influencing us towards Jesus, towards a life that glorifies Jesus, towards a life that is being sanctified, okay? That process of being transformed into the image of Jesus. The believer experiences the fruit of the Spirit and true growth in Christ. As we cooperate as well with the Holy Spirit 
through our dependence in Christ and we, what he accomplished at the cross. Again, as we cooperate, what is produced is victory over sin. The sin nature within us is rendered powerless. The divine nature, will, which is the Holy Spirit, and his grace will reign in our life. That's what Paul dealt with in Romans chapter 5, 20 and 21. And then as we cooperate with the moving and the influence of the Holy Spirit, good works are produced. Good works such as giving, caring, praying, Bible reading, worship, church attendance, etc. now flows from the heart of the believer. And now with all this said, this doesn't mean, and I'll put myself back on the screen again, with this said, this doesn't mean that we're always going to want to do these things, okay? Uh, as you can see this chart here, our main responsibility is the proper object of faith, that it's Jesus and what he accomplished on our behalf of the cross and the fact that he rose from the dead. That's our main responsibility. And as we continue in our relationship with God, that continues to be our main responsibility, to trust, depend in Christ's work and not our own. And then again, we receive this influence of the Holy Spirit. That opens the door for the Holy Spirit to work in us in a, in a free way that is not frustrated. And as I've said already, but it's so important, it's worth repeating, we have to cooperate with the influence of the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't mean that we're always going to want to pray, to go to church, to get into the Word and feed on God's Word. That doesn't mean we're always going to want to, but we will want to at times, but there'll be other times that we won't. Why? It's because we're still in this body of flesh, and we have the influence of the flesh or the fall that's still within us, and the flesh doesn't want to do those things. Our own flesh wants to live based on how we, what we see, feel, and hear in the natural. And so what do we do when we don't want to? That's when we realize, okay, it's our, our Christian life is not based on how we feel or even our own want to or desires at times because we have to understand this exact process that's in this handout right here, the process that James is dealing with, the process that Jesus and really throughout the whole Bible that Paul dealt with, and it's this, that as we exemplify and live by faith in Christ and His Word, the Holy Spirit, the sanctifying grace of God works in us, and we by faithful obedience cooperate with Him so that even when there isn't the want to, by faith we do. Does that make sense? By faith we pray, we obey the Lord. And what happens when we obey the Lord by faith, even when we don't want to, you know what? The want to will come up, okay? The want to will be stirred up. And we will start with, I don't want to, but finish with, I want to. Does that make sense? It all happens when we cooperate by faithful obedience with the working of the Holy Spirit. All right, moving on to the next couple of verses that's a part of this passage he says in verse 15 and 16, this is all a part of the same theme here, okay? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Now, in this passage here, James is describing a brother in Christ who is experiencing the effects of persecution. That means a lack of basic necessities. Now, this is also important to understand that what James is meaning here is not talking about just simply the poor that's in the world, the homeless, all the homeless people that are in the world. That's really not what James is referring to here. Even though, I will say this, there may be times, and there will be times in our life, that there we will encounter a homeless person, and the Holy Spirit will lead us to give to that person. 
But I want to make it clear, that's really not, not what James is dealing with here. He's talking about a brother or sister in Christ that is lacking the, the basic necessities that they need. And in this case, it's most likely because of persecution. James is saying that if we as believers, we have the goods, okay, we, God's blessed us, and we have basic necessities that we need. And we're able to give some help to that other brother and sister who is lacking the basic necessities. For example, like food and clothing, primarily, and even shelter, if we're able to help with that in that area. He says here, what does it profit if we say we have faith and we come across this brother and sister in this place, in this condition, and we just simply say to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. In other words, God bless you, brother. And we're able to help them, but we don't. What profit is our faith in Christ and the cross if it doesn't provide help to our brothers and sisters in need? That is what James is saying here. And I'll add this thought to it. What is it profit if we say we have faith in Christ and the cross, but we don't love the body of Christ? We, we, we say we love Christ, but we don't like his body. We don't like the church, and we're and we're always criticizing, and we're always negative about everybody, except maybe our own little group, okay? And, and get this, the body of Christ is bigger than our own little group that we associate with. And that's so important. That's not, I'm not saying that we're, if we, we do that, we're not saved. But the idea is this, is that it's really hitting at the same theme that James was dealing with. And it's this, is that our true faith is going to be exemplified with love for especially for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you remember the new commandment that Jesus gave? He said, love one another as I have loved you. And by this will all people know that you are my disciples, you're my followers, you're true believers in Jesus by your love one for another. And I'll add this to it. Loving one another is not constantly getting on social media and just rebuking everybody. Okay, that's not true love. Yes, love does include rebuke and correction, but I've seen it so much in my life that sometimes people, believers, take that attitude that I'm operating in love and so I'm just going to rebuke everybody. And that's all they do is just rebuke and correct everybody. And they say, well, I've, God's given me the ministry of Jeremiah, you know, and, 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 and all of that is simply wrong. It's a wrong spirit. God didn't call you or anybody to just constantly rebuke everyone and call it love. Again, will there be correction at time? Yes, but love is mostly manifested with encouragement. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In that passage, the chapter of love, Paul explains love. And you notice in there, not one characteristic, the love that Paul gave there in that chapter, did Paul say that love corrects and rebukes everybody. No, but love never fails. Love is patient. Love is long-suffering. Love is kind. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongdoing. Whoa. Love is just, love believes all things, which means it believes the best in people. It views people the way God views people. And so that's so important. That's what James was dealing with. All right, we're going to end there today, but I believe that you've been blessed with this. I know this is something that we could feed on. We need to feed on all the time, understanding faith and the process in which God works and the fact that one day, we're going to stand before Jesus and give an account to how faithful we've been to what God has given to us. So God bless you and have a wonderful day in Jesus. It is our prayer that every video that you can see on this Cornell Ministries YouTube channel is a blessing to you and a help in your walk with the Lord. Let me ask you this. Would you prayerfully consider supporting Cornell Ministries through whether a one-time gift or a reoccurring monthly gift? No matter what the amount is, we would greatly appreciate it. You can do so through our CornellMinistries.com website. You can see that on the screen. Or you can text to give. Just text that number and just follow the prompts and give that way. Again, whatever the amount is, we would greatly appreciate it. God bless you greatly.